Hi, my name is Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to the Engineering Room, a series of conversations with influential people from our industry. This episode is a little different to the usual content on the Continuous Delivery channel. This is the first of a new mini series and is in addition to our, our usual weekly output. These discussions are meant to, be, to explore software development from a broad perspective and are meant uh, in part as a small kind of Christmas present to our viewers and subscribers and thank you for your support over the past year. If you'd like to see more content like this, please do subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, today I'm talking with a friend of mine who has certainly significantly influenced my thinking and almost certainly yours too. Uh, Martin is one of the most famous people in our industry the author of many important influential books and one of the original creators of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, Martin has a very wide perspective on software development and he's opinionated and usually right, at least to my mind. Uh, in his website, Martin has compiled a valuable resource of definitions, learning and insights that I at least regularly dip into to remind myself of the authority's definition of something or to track what's on Martin's horizon. Is a way of crystallizing ideas uh, that so that they resonate with people. Uh, if you've ever refactored your code, used dependency injection, or created a DSL, then you're building on the shoulders of this giant of our industry. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Martin Fowler. Hi, Martin. Hello. Thank Hello. you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, happy to uh, see you again. It's been a while. It has been a while. Uh, pandemic aside, even before that, it's been a while. <laughs> yep. So, so I, I know that you do a lot of work um, mentoring authors and speakers and, and, and others in their next steps. You've certainly helped me and were kind enough to review the early chapters of my new book, even though you were overloaded with work at the time. Um, and at, you mentioned to me several interesting sounding projects that you're helping people with. Would you mind talking about those a little bit and just describing the sorts of things that you're, that you're looking at at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I reached a point earlier this year when I realised I couldn't really do any more writing for a while, um, which is kind of a big shock to my system because I've always had a, a big writing project going on, a book or something that I've been trying to do at. But I realized that I'm actually spending more of my time mentoring other people. And it's better for me to do that because, I mean, the reality is I haven't been involved directly in a, in a sizable software project for a very long time now. And I've got distant. And I could try and change that, but hey, that would be work. Um, so what's easier for me is to work with people who are still connected with the realities of, of the day-to-day -day software and help them get their ideas out. Because let's face it, that's basically all I've done anyway. I've never been an original creator of ideas. I've always been a, someone who's looked at what somebody else has come up with, like refactoring. I didn't invent refactoring. I mean, it was other people who developed it. And then I looked at it and saw, this is a really useful technique. I think I can explain it well. I'm a good yeah. explainer. So what I'm doing in my book, men my current mentoring, is really trying to help other people with their explanation projects. So I've got three at the moment, um, three what I would call book length projects that I'm deeply involved in, which is why I didn't have time to add a fourth because it's just <laughs> too much, uh, as well as various other stuff that's popping on my website as well, uh, sort of old, single articles. But the three main book projects are all really quite interesting and, and very different. So the first one I'll start with is um, a colleague of mine in India, Unmesh Joshi who's been working on a set of patterns around distributed systems. And I mean, it started out really because he felt that, he, that our folks at Fortworks needed a good grounding in what's going on inside distributed systems that we use all the time. Kafka, Cassandra, all of these systems are out there doing quite a lot of about quite sophisticated distributed work. And even though you're not gonna build your own messaging system or database, you often need to know a good sense of how they work because without that, you don't know how to utilize them properly. You don't know how to debug problems. I wouldn't necessarily call it mechanical sympathy because you're not getting down to the hardware level, but you yeah. are getting, you do need some sympathy with the underlying platform that you're working with, a kind of platformish sympathy um, to be able to, at you know, times when you need to focus on performance or, or the way that things are operating. Yeah, I so think he's got. 
Go ahead. Yep. So, sorry, I, was, I, just, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was, I was just going to say, I, I, I think there are some. Um, I, I, I've characterised the, the, the kind of the uh, the distributed computing uh, problem as, as kind of our, our version of quant, you know, quantum mechanics. It's you know you take a re a relatively tiny step uh, in your software and you're in very deep water quite quickly, quite easily if you're not careful. And yes. so there are some principles that that matter a lot to be able to you know guide a design to be able to cope with the, the, this explosion of complexity that you buy into as soon as you've got bits of software working on more than one computer in more than one yeah panel. exactly and so he felt that um our folks in um, needed to be sort of have a better exposure to that particularly yeah. we hire a lot of people straight out of college and the like and they don't have enough background in this so he started setting up some training work primarily based in, in our, our india um, operation which is pretty sizable these days um, and he contacted me and we developed the idea of trying to pull this first stuff out in terms of patterns, because patterns mm -hmm. are always I, I, the technique that I've found very effective to try and explain different solutions you have to problems and to be able to choose between them and know how they fit in a context. With yeah. patterns, you don't get a kind of set, you know, do these 10 steps and you lead to happiness. It's more like yeah. here are 20 things you have to consider and you have to navigate between them and choose trade offs between them. Yeah. And the way in which that he's developed this is he's gone into the source code of things like Kafka, Cassandra, React, all sorts of distributed systems, you know, lots of different languages and figured out exactly how they handle coming up to consensus um, mm -hmm. and things of that kind, and then tried to pull the patterns out. And then we've worked together to help describe those patterns. Yeah. So he's been publishing those on my website over the course of the last year year and a half perhaps that we've been putting them out we've, we've just got another batch that's going into um, some copy editing review mm -hmm. um, that go into things like paxos and some of the replicated log stuff behind raft and how really complicated two-phase commit can get when you're doing <laughs> yeah. this kind of stuff yeah um, it's some really interesting stuff the paxos stuff in particular took quite a bit of mental effort to um, figure out how to understand it let alone explain it yeah um and this I, I expect will turn into a book um we haven't sort of lined up publishers or anything yet but i i'm not expecting any problems trying to find someone who'd want to pull this thing thing through it and that that's one of them and that's a very deep technical uh, topic to dive yeah into. It's, uh, it, it, uh, it's it's a topic that i i find particularly interesting like I, I kind of started working on distributed systems a very long time ago and to some degree, I think that the technologies have made the problems more difficult because it used to be harder to do it. <laughs> it used to be harder mm. to, to get you to, to begin to start to remote, make you know, interact with things remotely. Now it's so easy and the tooling is so good that makes this a small step that's almost invisible, but you're still buying into all of this complexity. That I, I wondered whether you know that's an aspect of, of this that. Um, I, I, I'm certainly not saying that people today are less smart than people a long time ago. It's just that you, a long time ago you were you you were, you were just more exposed to the problem earlier on in the process of making that you know making that step. I think. Yeah, and I mean, I've always argued that the last thing you want is that you want to avoid distribution as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it is absolutely. such a complexity booster. So yeah. if you can avoid building a distributed system, avoid it, please, yeah. because it's going to yeah. make your life yeah. so much easier if you can yeah. avoid distribution, just like concurrency. You can avoid yeah. concurrency, do so, yeah. please, because yeah. it's going to make things so much better. But yeah. there are times you cannot, or you know, you're building on top of something that's got this distributed substrate on it, and it's going to do weird things to you if you don't understand what's going on, and you just have to be, deal with it. And so this is a way of at least trying to visualize and explain some of those underlying things that are going on so that when weird things happen, you know why. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I, I, I think is kind of interesting is that the you know, problematic as it was for in some other circumstances, the relational database model of, you know, the, the three tier architecture kind of system that we that we all built. Uh, relational databases gave us a model for synchronizing changes that we didn't have to worry about too much when, when programming against them because they looked after part of the problem with you know in the scope of a transaction and stuff like that and as soon as you start doing this with technologies that are not it, it gets a bit scary I, I did some consultancy for 
a client who I shan't, shan't name, which is a very large development. And they were using a, a non-SQL data store that didn't have any transactional integrity. And so I, you know, I kind of looked at this and it made me as nervous as hell because mm. uh, as far as I could see, it was just look of the draw, what, what the state of this system ended up being, depending on you know, which, which, which record landed first. There, there was no management of the concurrency in this system because people weren't thinking about these sorts of things. So it seems important to be able to worry about these sorts of principles and so on. Yeah, and I mean, transactions, even with a single database, are not necessarily uh, just a simple solution because no, no. you can't hold a transaction open for, for as long as you need to. So you have, have to work around that. And that, that's something we got involved in with a Patents of Enterprise Application Architecture book that I wrote 20 yeah. years ago. And Dave Rice sat down and worked through and explained some of the patterns that you need to deal with so that you can handle that kind of stuff. What we yeah. referred to as business transactions that you could keep open for quite a long time in order for people to do their work, but at the same time resolve them against the system transactions that need to be open for a short time because you don't want to hold a, a, a system transaction open for very long because it leads to uh, things being blocked. Absolutely. So even transactions, I mean, they certainly help because you need that ability to be able to update yeah. five things and know that it's becoming, it's atomic, but yeah. um, you still have to work around it even in a, in a single processor system. When we move into a distributed system, then there's a whole bunch of things because now you haven't got one clear source or at least you can easily get yourself into a situation where you haven't got one clear source. And of yeah. course, often the solution is to say one node has to be the leader and yes. you have to talk to the leader and then the leader will ensure that the followers mm. uh, match that. But then, of course, how do you have a leader? What happens when the leader goes down? All that kind of stuff comes into play. And that's, that's when distributed consensus protocols like Paxos and Raft come into, come into play. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's part of that thing. And so it's a just been very interesting to dig into that and i'm glad it's somebody else who's going through all this source code to figure out how <laughs> these open source systems do this um, yeah. in, rather than me and, he, and and he's building it he's doing it the way i would do it which is well i don't quite i need to understand what's going on so let's build my own simple implementation just so that i can illustrate the key point and yeah. i'm referring back to the real thing and looking comparing it to this and using that back and forth and then using, of course, those code examples uh, to help illustrate and explain um, in the book material. And I, 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 I always think that's one of the, the interesting parts of, uh, of writing or, or publishing ideas to, to try and help people better understand them is that the difference between it, it's no good just showing somebody an enterprise system because it's too mess, messy and complicated to be able to see the yes. wood for the trees. And so being able to synthesize examples and descriptions that can be realistic enough to demonstrate a concept without being realistic enough to hide the concept <laughs> yeah and that that is one of the challenges of coming up with examples of course you yeah yeah but it's always going to be toy because you can't make it real because as you say if it's realistic enough then you're not going to be able to understand it but yeah. at the same time you've got to ca catch the core of the problem and and yeah. coming up yeah. with good example design I mean, I find when in my writing, um, I mean, I have been in the situation with this is a refactoring book where I might spend two days just coming up with an example. Yeah. And then once I've got the example, the actual prose and the explanation, yeah. I can knock that off in a few hours. But trying to find the right example that just illustrates exactly what I'm after, that can be really, really hard. And then just finding this as well as trying to get the right thing that will show what's going on and not be overwhelmingly complicated, it's, it's a tricky balance to, to grab and it takes a lot of time to come up with them. Indeed, yeah. So, so where, where does this book sit kind of between uh, things like Patterns of Enterprise Architecture and Gregor Hope's book on, um, yeah, on patterns for, um, I've forgotten the title of his book, but the uh, message, message messaging, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it fits definitely within that family, I right. would say, right. because it, it I mean, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think of it as a similar kind of level if you want to understand how the, the, these core distributed systems that you're building on work to a degree that you can have that appreciation, that sympathy. Right. Um, 
it's not specifically about how you organize a messaging system, which is what sorry, Gregor's and uh, Bobby's book do. Yeah, uh, does. But um, again, it, it, you, when you're working with something that works in this kind of way, you need that sympathy as to how it's operating under the hood to at least some degree. It, it, it sounds interesting. So, so, so is it is it is that a book that's kind of nearing completion or is it is it just starting out you, you said you've been collecting uh, patterns for a while we're well into the process i don't yeah. know that we've really sat down at unless she's really sat down and said this is you know where we would think the ending boundaries lie um this particular last batch um mm -hmm. that really looked at uh, consensus algorithms like paxos raft and um two-phase commit um those took a particularly long amount of time to work through yeah. because yeah. they're complicated um things um, so we'll see. At some point, we'll sit down and get a sense of, OK, how far are we with that? Um, but the nice thing is readers can look at it now. I mean, the, the stuff I'm mentioning at the moment isn't out there as, as we speak. It may be by the time um, this is actually uh, made visible. Um, but there is still a lot of stuff here about replicated logs, high watermarks, low watermarks, mm -hmm. um, and things of that kind. That is a good chunk of material that, that's there on the site at the moment. Cool. I, 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 one, one, of, one of the other... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm where you can use it appropriately. I, I, I quite like eventual consistency models as well, and, and right. kind of the, the, the match between um, drawing the right kind of seams in your problem domain so that the eventual consistency doesn't trip you up. Uh, and I think right. that's, what, that's one of the things that we managed to get reasonably nicely organized with, with the LMAX system that, that you right. wrote about on your site a few years ago. Um, yeah. was that you know we could, that there were things like we, we didn't really mind that the order history w wouldn't necessarily be perfectly in sync with the the current order picture as long as each was true was true in the context in which you were going to view it <clears throat> right and then and, and that kind those kinds of decisions important because you have to rely on a certain degree of eventual consistency if you're going to get the kind of throughput and res again it's the classic safety versus liveness trade-off yes yeah. i can make a perfectly safe system it just won't do anything <laughs> <laughs> i need it to be alive <laughs> and so you're trading that off all the time it's always yeah. every so everything in terms of concurrent or distributed system because a distributed system is just a form of concurrent system is yeah. a trade-off of safety and liveness i yeah. mean the difference yeah. between a distributed system and a single process concurrent system is um, with at least a single process concurrent system you don't have bits of your system falling it either all <laughs> falls over or none of it does but with a distributed system you know bits and pieces fall off all the time so you've, yeah. you've got to yeah. deal with that um but yeah i, th I think this, i i'm very excited by this work it I, but uh, unless he's doing i think he's really sort of doing a good job of, i think it will be a really solid book for people in the future to learn about how distributed systems work in practice cool um, and of course the in practice is kind of important because you do certainly run into some things that are talked about a lot in theory but not used in practice because there are practical gaps in that theory <clears throat> paxos um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we we, we we came to a similar I, I can't remember why i was looking at it. it might have been when i was writing involved in the reactive manifesto but i remember looking into paxos and raft a little bit and you know <laughs> at least somebody pointing out that, that, that there might be, <laughs> be some problems <laughs> right so, yeah, so, so, so you, me you mentioned the, you mentioned the other yeah you mentioned another two yeah okay, there's two more to come so the second one I'm going to mention is, is quite different in that it's, and it's a bit unusual because most of what I like to write about is stuff that's already well, fairly well known, just not very widely disseminated. Now, when I wrote the refactoring book, it wasn't new in the sense that people have been doing it for years. It just wasn't very widely known. And similarly, yeah. these distributed patterns, they're not new, they're in the open source products that we all use, but they're not widely enough understood, and so yeah. therefore yeah. need to be disseminated more. This is a slightly different thing. This is uh, a book that uh, Shemak Dagani is working on, on data mesh. So here we've got really a way, this is kind of more speculative and new, because we're actually, we're in the middle of first data mesh projects around the world in our ThoughtWorks practice. So this is definitely bleeding edge stuff. Mm -hmm. Although in a way it's kind of not because it's taking principles from that we've been using for you know a couple of decades and saying we need to apply this to analytic data. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea of data mesh is 
a lot of people, when they look at analytic data and trying to take anal analytic data from across a large organization, their approach is, well, centralize it, get it all into one big data storage, data lake storage approach, and yeah. use centralized tools to understand that data and then disseminate it out to its users. Yeah. And what Jamaica said was, it, and, and the rest of many other people have said, um, and within ThoughtWorks, surprise, surprise, is saying, that just doesn't work in practice, that kind of decentral, that sign of centralized approach. What yeah. instead you need is a decentralized approach where the domain that creates the data is responsible for publishing an analytic data feed. Yeah. Um, they think of that data feed as a product. So as well as you know, the operational systems that, that work on that data, you also have an analytic data feed, which is a product that you think about with product management. Um, an organization is then going to have to build a platform to allow people to be able to publish these data feeds and consume these data feeds and come mm -hmm. up with a decentralized governance approach um, to handle this. So that now, if I want to pull together a new analytics um, a new analysis of what's going on in the organization. My job is instead of going to this centralized warehouse or data lake that has everything I ever want, except I'm not really quite sure what it all is. Mm -hmm. I actually look at the particular data products from different, different parts of the organization. I can see what they do. I can understand where they come from because I'm looking at the actual data product group themselves. If I need to change what data is available, so look at some new data that they currently aren't publishing i can talk directly to the people who have that data um and then i you know connect up with that it's a much more decentralized approach um but is one i feel that is much more realistic to being able to deal with this kind of data because this the throw it all in a big centralized place approach always sort of makes me feel terribly uncomfortable mm -hmm. um because for start i mean the modeling problem i mean yeah. what is a customer Go into any large organization and you'll find you can't they, they want to have this single view of what a customer is a you know, single definition and you're smiling because you've seen it too right it can never <laughs> yeah. work yeah, different yeah. parts yeah. of the organization they will look at customers differently quite naturally yeah. um they will have different things that they will class as a customer um and you can either try and unify that all together and it's a horrible mess or you can say, well, we understand we're going to have these different views and we're going to have to live with them and manage the complexity of that. Yeah. And that's a, it's a, in many ways, it's coming up like agile is about realizing you can't predict the future. It would be wonderfully much, our job would be much easier if we could predict the future. But since we can't, <laughs> we have to work, we have to manage the complexity of it. Similarly, yeah. I think of data mesh is about managing the reality of the complexity of analytic data. The problem, of course, is that not many people are doing it. Many yeah. people are going with a centralized approach. So we're having to figure out what the tools are, figure out the governance structures, figure out how to make this work. And that's what we're doing kind of live with the clients who realized that the centralized approach isn't going to work and we're going to have to create an approach that's much more decentralized. And what Jamak is doing is taking the experiences we've learned so far and putting them into a into a book form that so that other people can at least be a, slightly more ahead of the game than than we've been in our pro, in our sort of first uh, pioneering projects. Mm. That sounds that sounds interesting. There's there's another idea that's crossed my event horizon recently, which is which is called data pipelines. Which I don't know whether the people that are talking about that are talking about something similar, but that also sounds similar to. It, it's at least at least in me trying to understand what the the, what, the way in which you described it, the the pigeonholes that that I'm slotting right. it in into are um, what one of the things that we did. Uh, LMAX was that we, 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 we were all event based, the, the whole system. So, right. so analytic data like you're talking about was what, what was generated as a stream of events like anything else. But we had a number of different kind of um, application specific points in the system that would be in trip that would consolidate the data to be able to tell a particular story. Uh, about that is that the kind of thing that you're talking about so, so extent, how, but how, do you, again, how do you synthesize a, how do you synthesize a message off this stream of events i suppose i mean that's it? part of it um mm -hmm. because i mean really the challenge is when you're dealing with a really large enterprise i mean yeah. i mean yeah lmax was a big project but it, it wasn't a big enterprise. The team. 
Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It yeah, was, yeah. you know, yeah. you didn't, you, when you've got a hundred different teams scattered around a big organization, sure. just dealing with that amount, that's yeah. the problem. You can, you can effectively centralize all the data for LMAX because you've got one team that's understanding it. I mean, you yeah, have so, to have the core model of LMAX in your head, right? It fits in your head. Yeah. Um, if, if you're talking about, you know, an airline like Delta Airlines, mm -hmm. you know, it, you can't fit all that in your head. It's just too yeah. big, too yeah. complex. And that's when you start to have to decentralize your operational systems and also decentralize your analytics. So, 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 so the bit, the bit that I'm trying, the bit that I'm trying to understand is. So, so absolutely, you're you're right in, in terms in terms of the um, the difference in the in the scale. But um, the bit that I'm trying to understand is how you tell how, how you tell a story. So I I don't know if if you've got a if the output of a particular part of the system is streaming out you know one you know a bunch of orders or something like that you need to cut at some point you might need other information to synthesize a picture that you're interested in if you're talking about right. analytics right yeah so 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 the bit that i was trying to pull out is so uh, am what i thought that you were saying was that you have these streams you have in in the architecture of the system you have these streams generating this information and then you 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 build a target specific you know a, a focused application on telling you know, one particular picture that you're interested in, and it it gathers the streams that it's interested in. It 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 paints the picture and does whatever it needs to be able to do to 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 pack, to consolidate that picture from the different data streams that the streams of events, the streams of information that it's interested in. That, yeah, I guess the, the way I'm, I'm missing the point. The way I look at it is, it, let's say you're um, wanting to do some analysis on data from that's going to pull, 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 require you to grab data from different parts of an organization. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, think of maybe an airline. Part of it, information I need is from customer, yeah. um, tying into customers. Some of it is perhaps some operations of the airline. Um, yeah. And how, where do I go about to do that? So in a centralized mm -hmm. approach, there would somewhere be a centralized data lake that would have mm -hmm. all of this information of customer and operation stuff, yep. you know, as, you know, whatever form it happens to be in, but a big mm -hmm. place in which I just go to that one-stop shop, as it were, and grab it. Yeah. But the trouble is, do I really know where that data's come from? How is that data organized? Um, again, when we've got different views of what a customer is or what a flight might is, mm -hmm. um, it's it's difficult to tie these things together. Mm -hmm. So in a data lake view of the world, instead of having this one big place you go to, you will go to the individual business units themselves. They will publish the data about what their business unit does as a data product. Right. And they will document that data product. They'll have some degree of product thinking that goes to how to deal with that product. You'll be able to understand where that data is coming from because it's going from with you organization that created that data. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to go out and use the platform to find where those data products are and pull them together. Yeah, yeah. So, but the point is the management, you're not getting this centralized management approach. Yeah, yeah Centralized sure. consolidation. Yeah. So, it, and how they publish that, whether it's terms of feeds of events or tables of some kind of consolidated data is up to the individual data products. Yeah, yeah. So I might, as a data product, so, well, one of my data products is a sort of fairly continuous feed of events, mm -hmm. um, but I'm also going to publish something that consolidates some of that information together within my bounds and provides yeah. that consolidated data. And you can use whichever one of those products you think is appropriate for the analytics that you're doing. Cool. Sounds interesting. It is. I mean, it's a, it, as I said, it, it's, it is definitely what we're working on at the moment. Um, as opposed to, yeah, there's a long history of doing this, but I think it's a yeah. necessary direction because yeah. when you're talking about large enterprise things, trying to do anything involving centralizing data has yeah. too often been a fool's errand. And that's doubly true of analytic data because you've got a lot of history involved. Yeah. Um, so you have to start thinking about making a lot of that the temper data by temporal, for instance, so that you understand not just what is this data as of a time, but of, of the time you understood the information. Because one of the problems, of course, with historic data is not just the, the data change, your understanding of that data changes. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. 
there's what I refer to as, you know, time is not the, the fourth dimension. It's the fourth and fifth dimensions. Yeah. Um, and it ends up being a lot more complicated than you'd think. Yeah. Oh, it's, it sounds like a, it sounds like an interesting book. Yeah. And she, that is not going out through my website. That's going out through the O'Reilly work. So it's actually going to be around an O'Reilly book, hopefully out early next year. Um, cool. And there are, I think some pre the, the, the O'Reilly preview system yeah, is yeah. beginning to work on it as well. Jumak has written a couple of articles on, uh, that are on uh, martinfowler.com um, about data mesh. So I think if you want a broad overview of what data mesh is about, if you hunt down those, hopefully you'll provide links in show notes or something. And yeah, of course. Into that. Um, but I definitely think this is the kind of direction we want to go in when it comes to managing analytic data across any kind of large organization. Yeah. And, and you know, that that kind of you know, one of my one of my things in terms of in terms of a, a, approach is just techniques to manage complexity and that that you know trying you know one one data structure to to rule them all is not a way to manage complexity. No, <laughs> no I mean it either gets too big and bloated because it has to hold every possible piece of data. Um, or it gets horribly abstract and just becomes, you know, yeah. um, record related to record and you, know, you yeah, get nowhere yeah. that way. Um, so you're always trapped when you deal with these things. And this, this, I think, was one of the big things that I think that really came out of Eric Evans's work in domain driven yeah. design and the notion that you have to think of any large organization in terms of multiple bounded contexts, yeah. understand each context individually and how it relates to its neighbors. Yeah. Um, and build that up. And in fact, that's very much what data mesh builds on. It says mm -hmm. you're going to have these bounded contexts and you have to think of it in terms of bounding context. So another way of thinking about it, it's thinking that it's basically applying the ideas of domain driven design, strategic design thinking yeah. to analytic data. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That, that, that was what that was precisely what was going through my head when you were describing it. Good. And so I, I had um, I had a, I had an interesting conversation with Eric a few weeks ago. We were talking we were talking about something else. We were talking about um, microservices um, architectures, and he made an observ that observation that clicked with me that I liked, which was that the the protocol of exchange of information between the services is a distinct bounded context. It, mm. It's it's not not the same as the, yep. the, the 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 context that the the services represent um and, and there's not there's not one that's shared between all the services that there are multiple ones in, in different conversations but but I, I this is similar this this is a separate yep. kind of context in which and has separate needs no doubt i would imagine yeah yes um very much so um it suddenly triggered a point uh something left to, yeah there's actually it, it was the point that uh there's an article currently being worked on, again, may have been published by the time this is uh, visible by uh, Brandon Byers, who's again one of my colleagues here in, in North America. And he talks about the fact that when people do these architecture charts, they put a lot of emphasis on the blobs, mm -hmm. but often mm -hmm. the hard part is the lines connecting the blobs, <laughs> the integration. Indeed. And Absolutely. how into a lot of companies think, oh, integration is some kind of simple thing, um, but it's actually not, as, as we know, it isn't. And also, the, his point is, it's not something you can buy. You can buy the blobs, but you have yeah. to build the lines yourself. Yeah. And building those lines is not easy. Yeah. And it is actually often a part of a critical part of a, an organization's competitive advantage is if you're able to do integration better than your competitors, um, it can really give you a noticeable edge. Yes. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm, I was very uh, taken with uh, what he's um, saying in that article. Um, so uh, hopefully that will be published in the next few weeks. Cool. And the third book in your list. The third book. So the third book is sort of back to stuff that we know and have known for a long time um, in a really interesting way. So um, this is a collaboration between um, at least two of these folks you'll know, James Lewis and Ian Cartwright, um, yeah. who you and Rob Horn's the third guy who is newer to Fort Work, so you probably haven't come across it. And they're working on uh, patterns of legacy displacement. How do we displace legacy systems in a more mm -hmm. sane way? And of course, a lot of this is about fighting against the, oh, well, let's spend five years building a replacement system and then we'll switch it over because we know yeah. how well that works. <laughs> um, and... But the thing is, we haven't 
in all of the years, I mean, I've been in software business for 30 years or so. During that whole time, replacing legacy systems has been a major part of our work. And mm -hmm. yet there's not been very much written about it and not much yeah. understanding of how do we think about legacy replacements yeah. in an effective yeah. way. And so what we're trying to do with this book project is capture that information again in the form of patterns. Yeah. Um, so and, you know, because these folks have done a lot of uh, legacy replacement, of course, mm -hmm. because that's so, such a large part parcel of our work. And they're trying to get that information down and in place. And so I'm really keen about this project because I think it's going to help a great deal to our understanding of how we best go about this exercise, which is just not talked about enough mm -hmm. um, in our industry. And, and yet it's such a central part. And it's not as if it's going to stop. You know, as I start to say, we're building tomorrow's legacy systems today. Yeah. Um, and if we can better understand how we displace them, then we can build better now, but we can also get through a better approach of understanding that. And of course, the key to this is gradual process. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't displace a legacy system all in one go. You do yeah. it over time. It may involve creating transitional pieces of software that you know you're going to throw away yeah. um, in a year or two's time, but it's going to ease the process of that legacy change because it's a constant um, process. And so it's this is early days. Um, they dropped their first bunch of patterns onto uh, the website um, a mm -hmm. few months ago. Um, at the moment, we've got a second batch kind of uh, um, that's sent out to our internal review list on, on foot, the, foot, the infamous Fortwork software dev mailing list, which yep. um, everything has to go through. Um, so again, probably by the time uh, this goes out, that second batch will be out there. And I'm really hoping this can turn into an important book as well, because I think they've, they've got the knowledge. Um, yeah, yeah. They've got the desire, I think, to get this information out. The challenge, of course, as for any Fortworks consultant, is finding the time to sit and write. But we're working yeah, on that. Yeah. I think this could be a really good book. Cool. And, and, and is, is that so, so you said there's not much written. The, the, the only one that I can think of in that, in that space is Michael Feather's book on working with legacy code. Uh, is, right. Is, that is this a different kind? Well, I guess this is a, diff a slightly different kind of book to that. Yeah, operates at a higher level because I think what we're talking about is when you've got a legacy system that again is running a whole enterprise. Yeah. How do you replace that? So yeah. we're talking about components which are themselves sizable systems. You know, a yeah. component of this. I mean, Lmax would be one component that you kind of yeah, say, yeah. "Oh yeah, that's Lmax. That's a blob," right? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you replace that blob with all of these lines that are connecting to it in a way that, you know, isn't yeah. going to drive people insane? Um, and so we're operating at that kind of level. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's it's very much a complement. It's kind of more like the enterprise architecture um, complement to what's in, le in uh, the legacy code system is how do you take a particular individual system and replace yeah. the bits of it? Um, so there's, and there's definitely going to be lots of overlap, I think, as I dig a bit deeper into doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, I mean, encouraged particularly. I mean, the first batch of patterns that the the most the key central pattern they put in was actually an anti-pattern, effectively, which is that of the um, the feature um, replication. Uh, what was the mm -hmm. term they used? I uh, have to look at it again to remind my what was the word? Uh, feature parity. Right, mm -hmm. where we say, oh, if we're going to replace a legacy system, let's build a new system that has feature parity to the old system. And I see the smile on your face. <laughs> we know how that normally works out. Yeah. So <laughs> part of that pattern was to say, don't do this. Or at least yeah, yeah. feature parity can work, but yeah. only in a very limited set of contexts. And that was one of the things that we worked through in, in writing the pattern. I dislike, I'm very wary of saying something is always wrong. Yeah. But I am very conscious of saying, well, things are often used outside their context of applicability. Mm -hmm. Feature parity can work, mm -hmm. but it's such a narrow context that it does that <coughs> you've got to be aware of that and realize that you know, most of the situations we run into, it's not the right context. Yeah. Um, and so the, one of the first patterns they wanted to, was to say, this is where feature parity breaks down, where you have to use some other kind of approach instead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just, just as a, one of the things that was going through my head when you were describing that is many, many, many years ago, I worked on a, 
a system that was replacing, I think this is probably the third or fourth replacement of um, uh, legacy systems in a car manufacturer. And this was a, a car configuration system that described all of the different mm -hmm. bits that came together to, 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 to make up a car. And the, we were writing this in Java and the core, the, the core model that we had to retain was fundamentally based on the 80 characters of a punched card. <laughs> and we could we, we we couldn't get away from it because all of everything we laid on the relied on this massively complicated kind of um overblown customized version of some kind of weird lemp or zip algorithm that kind of if this bit and this bit is set it means this so if this bit and this bit is set it means this other thing entirely and it's just it's just this overloading of information and building and testing those sorts of things it, it get, gets complicated quickly but it's, it's certainly an inter interesting problem and 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 definitely definitely a place where there are lots of patterns to mine i'm sure yeah i mean one of it i mean i'm gonna again talk about one of the things that's currently under in, in the review process is a pattern that's un, called um, divert the flow um and this is a very interesting pattern the, the core heart of it is actually in another pattern there's a very situ common situation i've kind of implied it already where your business management relies upon some system that ag aggregates information from all over the enterprise and pulls together and it's a critical system um mm -hmm. and we refer to return to in the pattern terms we're calling it the critical aggregator mm -hmm. and this is important because the key mat leadership and the organization they're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that's based on this aggregation of, of data now having a critical aggregator is itself not necessarily a bad thing in fact it's usually a good thing because mm -hmm. you want something that pulls together critical information for order to make decisions. Yeah. The problem was, is that in most legacy systems, it's metastasized into this awful thing that will reach deep into core data structures <laughs> of operational systems. Yeah. And as a result, you can't touch anything because yeah. I don't change this data, these five tables over here, because I'm scared that it's going to break the critical aggregator. Because yeah. the critical aggregator, it's critical. It has to keep running. Yeah. So how do you deal with this? So one pattern that, 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 um, that uh, was being, they're writing up at the moment is called divert the flow. And divert the flow says, it's kind of counterintuitive in a way, but it says the first thing you should replace in a legacy system is often that critical aggregator. Mm -hmm. Rebuild the critical aggregator and give it better interfaces so that you yeah. can actually substitute the input points better. Yes. Um, the, the alternative is basically when you is replacing the the upstream systems but creating a legacy mimic that sort of looks mm -hmm. like the old systems so and the aggregator can still work because usually the problem with the legacy aggregator is you can't replace its connections because yep. they're just so deeply entwined in so you have to pretend the old systems are still there with your new ones yeah the yep. problem with legacy mimic though is if you use a legacy mimic yeah it complicates the building of the new systems because you've got this more messy thing to deal with but yeah. it also means if you've got opportunities to provide new information that would be really handy for the critical aggregator you can't do it because you yeah. can't yeah. go through that legacy connection well if yeah. you replace the critical aggregator first a it gives you greater safety in replacing other parts of the system because you've got a much more sane um tying to the critical aggregator but also, if you're now using some information that you didn't have before, you've got the opportunity to feed it into the critical aggregator because you can update the critical aggregator to use that new information. And yeah. so even though it's counterintuitive, because you kind of feel, well, that's the critical aggregator, I don't replace this first because it's scary. <laughs> yeah. Often, replacing it first can be the best route to go. And so yeah. that's yeah. a pattern that, we, that uh, they're referring to as divert the flow. And the, 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 the divert the flow is a, is a metaphor of saying that if you, if you want to replace um, a dam, the first thing you want to do is divert the flow of the river so that you can work on the dam without having it be affected by the uh, so, so, stuff so coming down from upstream. So, so once again, referring back to Eric Evans, you, you, you're going to you, you're going to use that and start to build anti-corruption layers to to allow right. you to assemble the new the new criti the critical aggregator. Yeah. 
Yep. Right. So that's the kind of pattern work that they're doing. So that gives you a sense of a level that they're operating yeah, yeah. at and how it relates, I think, to the, the, the uh, to Michael Fevers's work. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm very keen on seeing how this kind of stuff develops because this is definitely stuff we've done many times with our yeah, yeah. clients over the years. Yeah. And often the challenge is getting people to understand the trade-offs involved because the trade-offs are um, often not straightforward because people do come into this in the sense of, oh, let's just go for feature parity and move it yeah. to the cloud. Yeah. Um, and we go, <laughs> no, that's probably not what you really want to do. Um, and, and we if have it, if other it's, techniques. If it's, if it's really a legacy system, you probably don't know what all the features are anyway, because all the people and the people have gone in the doc. It's not they're poorly documented. <laughs> well, exactly, and of course, often it's doing things that you don't want it to do. Indeed, um, yeah. And so, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff around that. So I'm keen to see this one, and and so so there you see the three um, books I'm mentoring, and the intellectual whiplash that I go yeah. through switching from one of those to the other. <laughs> I, 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 I said in your intro that you had a broad perspective. <laughs> well, it's good. nice because I don't have to be the expert on any of these topics, right? I, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm relying upon the others who are actually got their fingers deep in the practicality of it. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the reason progress would, would like progress to be faster on this legacy displacement is because, of course, they're all billing to clients doing this work doing exactly yes. this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. Um, and um, it's great to be able to tap into that. And my role is just to, I mean, I've got enough knowledge to ask good questions and enough ignorance to ask good questions. Yeah, yeah. Because you need a bit of both, um, <laughs> I think, to be able to, to do that. And uh, I find it a lot of fun because I'm getting the chance to say, well, what do you mean by this? How is this working out? And, um, yeah. It's I, I, really I, interesting I, conversations. I, 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 I think that's one of my skills is that, is that I, I, I need to dumb things down to understand them so I can ask the dumb questions. <laughs> yeah. 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 And what I also like is that these, these books are all are also very, very practical. Yes. Um, you can really take away what they're saying and make use of it right away, which is something that's always been very important to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. by writing whether it's the books or the website i want i always want to say what can people do with this on monday yeah um, they've yeah. they've read it they've studied it now they've got to take away take it away and use it absolutely so so you in a, so, so that those sound fascinating I'm, I'm i'm looking i'm looking forward to all of those um and uh i, I I don't do much of the legacy stuff, the, the legacy integration stuff, the legacy refactoring stuff these days, except in the context of trying to make things work in the context of de continuous delivery. But that's still, I think there might, there might still be some useful patterns in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so in, in addition to this, I, I, I remember uh, a year or two ago, you also did an awful lot of work on assembling patterns around different branching strategies uh, and we were yep. talking about and that's a topic that's kind of I have some interest in and get some <coughs> sort of argumentative feedback on, on on this channel from time to time one of the oh, concepts yeah. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that in a slightly uh, interesting well I think a slightly different way rather than just going through the patterns themselves I think I might be a bit more opinionated in, on this topic than you and you've already touched on your approach to these things is that you don't like to say that people are wrong you want to talk about these ideas in the in a broad context um <clears throat> where where do you see the balance between for want of a better term kind of cataloging patterns and making recommendations because at some point you're going to have you're going to be you know explaining some kind your critical faculties on deciding whether this is a matter of advice and you don't want to be advising people to do things that you think are are really bad advice that are bad ideas so how how do you figure out how to draw that line is it is it there's got to be some context in which you can picture that it works or or you know how how, how do you figure out where, where where you know how to do that well i mean part of me is is it's a sense of a sympathy with <coughs> where people are and have been. I, I'm one of my big sort of non software things I do is I read a lot of history. Mm -hmm. um, reading history is always, and, and I've always maintained that if you want to understand why things are the way they are, 
it's good to understand the history. Because um, I, I remember there was criticisms when I wrote UML Distilled that I had a little bit at the beginning of the book, which is here's the history of, of object modeling. Mm -hmm. But in order to understand the UML, you had to understand the history that led to it, because otherwise all, all sorts of decisions didn't make sense. But then yeah. when you saw the history, you go, oh, I see now yeah, that makes sense as to where it is. Um, and it's like that with legacy systems. I said, well, people did this for a reason. It wasn't necessarily because they were being stupid. They often had mm -hmm. good reasons, but circumstances changed since. Yes. Um, and so if we can understand and have sympathy for where they were, um, a friend, uh, one of my colleagues, I can't remember who now, sort of referred to as it's, it's I think it was, yeah, I can't remember who it was, who said, we've got, to, we've got to think of it in terms of compassionate coding, have compassion for where people were as they made their choices and understand that we can get a better sense of where trade-offs come. And part of my thinking here is that when we see patterns out there that look awful, like the critical aggregator, mm -hmm. um, it's often there's a good, something good there. It's just been taken out of context or it's been you or been implemented badly or something of that kind. And this is particularly the case when it comes to branching. I mean, the, I mean we battle and you and I both battle against the sort of pervasive use of large scale feature branching and yeah. pull requests and the like. But it actually comes from a good place. I yeah. mean, if you're running an open source project, the feature branch model where you've got, you know, people who are contributing to the project who you don't know terribly well, they're operating on a very low duty cycle in the sense that, you know, they're not working full time on your project. They're working maybe, you know, yeah. half a day a week or something. In that kind of world, feature branching makes oodles of sense. It's an extremely yes, yes. effective strategy. Yes. But yes. the context, again, patterns are interesting because they talk about context. Mm -hmm. A pattern that is a good is a good thing to use in one context becomes questionable when you move it to another context. Yeah. So you take a pattern of feature branching, you move it to the context of a team that's working full time. There's half, there's half a dozen of you or a dozen of you. Um, suddenly your context different then suddenly feature branching becomes less apparent as you begin to realize oh now i get slowed down because i do feature branching because i can't refactor effectively yes. and particularly when you begin to employ other techniques such as self-testing code that allows you to be much more confident about detecting breakages than you would be otherwise suddenly other patterns um, become appealing mm -hmm. um and I mean, a large part of me writing the branching patterns was because I understand the value of feature branching in its context, where it comes from. Yeah. And trying to say, OK, so why is it that there's this sadly minority, it seems, of people who are saying, no, 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 no. We've got this better tool called continuous integration. We should be doing that instead in many yeah. in many contexts that we come into. Yeah. And wanted to really explore that without necessarily saying well feature branching is evil and we should never use it any any of the time because that's, yeah. it's not that situation it's a situation of understanding your context and your trade-offs and at the heart of in my mind of it is this issue of integration frequency mm -hmm. if you can increase your integration frequency you get a huge amount of benefits mm -hmm. because you're able to to um, refactor in particular, you're able to refactor more frequently and therefore keep your code in a healthier state. Yeah. So how do you improve your integration frequency? Well, you've got to you know, integrate more often, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, feature branching has this notion of saying I can only integrate once my feature is complete. Yeah. So you can improve the only way you can improve your frequency is by making smaller features. Well, actually, that's a good thing. We like small features, yeah. but you can't get them down often to be small enough. It yes. takes real effort to get them down to be small enough to the level that you can achieve with continuous integration, where you can be integrating many times a day. Yes. But that requires is a mental shift that says, I don't integrate when my feature is complete. I integrate when I'm in a healthy enough state to integrate, and yes. I can make progress keeping my code healthy pretty much all the time. When I can learn how to do that, I can easily integrate half a dozen, a dozen times a day. And then once I can do that, then all sorts of benefits of high frequency integration come to me. But I have yeah. to switch my mental node from saying, I don't integrate when my feature's complete. I integrate when I've got a stable um, build 
that I can integrate with. And I want to get that stable build all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the speed of feedback is, is, is uh, as, as I know that you would agree, is, is absolutely critical to being able to get that, 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 that clarity of picture frequently. Yeah. And, and I, I, I like the way that you described that. I, 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 I think... I don't think of myself as a dogmatic person, and I think I think I would think I would think of things in the in the same way. It's about the context. I think that one of the things one of the things that sometimes frustrates me is when people think about you know any patterns really is 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 just applying them blindly without reading the bit of the pattern where it says use this in this context or this you know this solves this problem, and it might not be the problem that you have. And, I, yeah, and I, see, I see that misapplication a lot because we just seem to work on a fashion sometimes. Yeah, there's a lovely quote that I, that I include that from a tweet from Camille Fournier um, that's in, that I mentioned in the article. It says, conflating open source software and private software development team needs is the original sin of current software development rituals. Yes. And I think that captures it just perfectly. That's the problem. I mean, yes. what works in an open source environment isn't the same as what works in a in a private um, software team. It's a different kind of culture, and you apply different kinds of rules. And, well, I, and this I, goes I right back to my right first pattern writing I did when I wrote the Patterns Enterprise Application Architecture book. That was partly a, a because I was ticked off at people saying there's one true architecture for all enterprise systems. <laughs> we say, no, our enterprise systems are different. Not everybody yeah. has the same problem. So therefore, you have to pick a different set of patterns. Yes. And the yes. nice thing about patterns is that they lend themselves to that line. And sometimes the trade-offs aren't completely clear. You've got a lot of gray space and blurry lines between things, and that's, that's OK. But you have to understand. Here are the contexts where different techniques apply. Pick the ones that work well in your context and would fit together with each other. Absolutely. That that gets me on to another thing that I wanted I wanted to, to ask you about. So 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 if if I may quote you back at you from your website, um, uh, on your website it says, if there's a theme that runs through my work and writing on this site. It's the interplay between the shift towards agile thinking and the technical patterns and practices that make agile software development practical. While the specifics of technology change rapidly in our profession, fundamental practices and patterns are more stable. I'm really interested in those kind of deeper insights too, in terms of what are the durable ideas and it seems to me that often we, we as software developers get a bit obsessed by things that are really a bit more, off, or more, more ephemeral than we believe them to be. And that the real value is, is in some other things. Could you expand a little bit on that idea? And what do you see as some of the underlying practices and patterns that might you know, be more be more generally applicable. I, I I perfectly accept maybe not maybe not globally applicable, but th there are always exceptions. But but what are the principles? What makes what are the things that are likely to end up with a, a higher chance of success and less likely to end up with tomorrow's legacy system today? Um. Well, I mean that's uh, yeah that's what my whole. Um, writing is about right it's trying yes. to identify those um i mean some of them are quite broad and some of them quite narrow um but the point is that you the i mean take um self-testing code for instance so i i use i like to use the term self-testing code as opposed to test-driven development um because test-driven development is a technique i love i really like using it a lot it's but to me the the core thing that I want is this self-testing code ability, which is I want to be able to be able to throw a command at the system and say, test yourself. And it comes back. And if it comes back green, I know, OK, I'm OK. The change I just made, I didn't break anything. Now, if I build the system using test driven development, I'll get there. And test driven development will also <coughs> help me with the design process as well. So it's a great technique. But yeah. the key output to me is having that self-testing code. And there are other ways to get that as well. but most of which are not as good as TDD, but it's self-testing codes the key. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a great technique that I can use any, almost anywhere. 
right? And I've I've used that technique in you know you'd use it in in Smalltalk, you use it in Java, you use it in JavaScript, all sorts of different languages. You have to make sure you get the tools to help you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, particularly after the rise of JUnit, people realize what that actually it wasn't that difficult to build tools that would help you build self-testing code. Yeah. And so you see JUnit ports and clones um, to all over the place. And of course, JUnit itself was a port of an original Smalltalk um, library. Yeah. Um, and so that's a, that, an example of that kind of fundamental notion that says, um, if you understand the importance of sales testing code, whenever you go to a new environment, the first thing you want to do is figure out how can I get my self testing set up going? Mm -hmm. How do I get that situation where I get that logical green bar that tells me, oh, okay, the change I just made, I didn't break anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's an example of one of those fundamental principles that to me transcends the technology that you're working in. And when you're yeah. in a technology where it's difficult, like UI technology often has that, then another principle comes to mind, which is the humble object, which says, if I've got something that's difficult to test, let's get every piece of behavior I possibly can out of that object into a separate object that I can test easily. Yeah. And then I can you know, take, relax with my green bar again. Yeah. So that's another technique and you use it with um, UI technology, but often also with distributed systems um remote interactions you immediately say okay i want to make a really simple gateway object that doesn't do very much so that i can test everything else mm -hmm. and keep everything else under test um and so that again the humble object a great um basic um idea that once you know it you can use it in a whole host of different places those are the things i i'm after whether they're very big like self-testing code in terms of scope or very small, like humble object, which is just a simple piece of how you get that kind of thing to work. Yeah, 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 yeah ab ab absolutely. I, I mean, I mean the 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 idea of I tend to use the term TDD, but self testing code is, I think, much. It has deeper implications than than people who don't practice it realize very often. Right. I think. And, you know, what, 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 as you say, you know, you get that surety that, yes, my code does what I think it works. But it also it's also the, the the shortest route to getting feedback on the quality of my design that I know right. how to achieve. If your test is hard to write, your design's bad. It's nothing wrong. It's not test fault. It's you, you've got a bad design. So change the design. Well, exactly. That's the, the, the beauty of TDD for me is that it forces you to think hard about interfaces. Yes. And we know that inter getting good interfaces is such a key part of getting a well-structured system. Yes. Because if you can get your interfaces working well, then that makes your code clear and understandable, makes it easier to change. Um, and also, you know, I, I can deal with a certain amount of mess in the implementation details. I'd rather not, but I can yeah. deal with it if it's contained and encapsulated behind good, clear interfaces. Yeah, but it's hard. It's hard to come up with a good interface. It's hard to learn how to do that as a as a developer. Yeah. And TDD's great strength is it kind of forces you to think about interface, get I, interface, I, and test it. If you'll forgive me advertising my book for a minute, mm. um, <coughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I I I went I went through an exercise. I wanted to demonstrate some some unpleasant code. I wanted to demonstrate some. Some, some problems in, in the code. And so I started writing this example as we were talking about earlier on and trying to come up with an example. And I started where I always start. I started doing test driven development and I couldn't, I couldn't write code as bad as I wanted it to be and do <laughs> test driven development. So I had to stop writing the tests and write the code as, you know, <laughs> I felt like I time traveled back 20 or 30 years. It was just, it was just crazy. Um, and so I, I, think, I think that's, you know, that's a deeply undervalued um, practice it it's one of those things when i first when when the light bulb went off over my head and i first practiced test driven development i thought oh this is going to take over the world i i was wrong twice i thought that i thought that object orientation was going to take over the world when I, the light bulb went over my head when i learned that too and, and neither of those is quite quite taken over the world in the way that i expected um but uh, but i still i, I still think i, I don't want to work in a, a team ever again that doesn't do test driven development really mm. you know day to day because i think that's much by far the most effective practice that's probably surfaced during my time as a software developer 
yeah i mean and i'm with you if i was working if i was doing real work again and having to write software on a team for a living i would definitely use tdd yeah yeah um the software i do write is just uh, my tool chain for my website um and i don't use as much tdd on there as um you would need to because uh, um because it's just producing output so yes. half the time I'm I don't have an expected value because I'm writing the code and looking looking at the screen saying is that okay, and also I have the perfect um, regression test suite because I just build the entire website and diff it against one that I know is good, um, which is a very crude regression test but it works very yeah. well. <laughs> but but then occasionally I'll come into situations where there is some more complicated behavior involved. And then, yes, I do have a bunch of unit tests to handle those because, and I sometimes use TDD to do that. Yes. Um, but again, it's knowing when to apply it in the right kind of circumstance. And once, you know, for most of the kind of commercial software that we work on at Footworks, TDD is, is an essential. And yeah. Uh, yeah. one of the nice things about this is, I'm in a new. I'm you know living in an organisation where things like TDD and continuous integration uh, are seen as a normal way of practice, yes. and that's to do with not so much me, but all of the leaders. You know, people like Brandon, uh, people like Eric Dernenberg, um, people like Unmesh, who carry that leadership through across the organisation because they've come to the same conclusion that you and I have. But yes. that's how we find find ourselves most effective. Yeah. And um, we just have to see how that spreads across the rest of the industry. I mean, it, in some ways, it's moved faster than, than I thought it would, actually, mm -hmm. um, because I know how long it takes for ideas to propagate. So yes, it's depressing because you'd like to think that it could have been a bit more widely used, and particularly the way in which so many people are taking on agile and completely forgetting these technical practices that actually are the underpinnings to make it work effectively. Yeah. Um, but um, but as I said, I mean, these things do take a long time to, to work through, particularly when we're in a profession that can't really measure our output and productivity effectively. Um, and when you can't do that, it makes it much harder to, to, to effectively use the scientific method on ourselves. Yes. Because, yes. you know, if you can't measure your outputs, then it's very hard to tell whether one thing's better than another. Well, that, that, that's that. So, so, so I, I, I thought that for a long time, uh, but I, I was, I was somewhat impressed by the Dora metrics oh, yeah. and the use of stability and throughput as measures of efficiency and quality. What, what, what's, what's your view on those? Oh, I'm a big fan of the Dora stuff. I mean, that's why I wrote, yeah. wrote the forward to uh, um, Nicole and and Jez's and uh, Jean's book. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I'm often very skeptical about these kind of, about a lot of the kind of measurement studies that I see in academia, um, because I, because again, it comes down to this, how do you measure your output? And are you mm -hmm. even measuring the right thing? If someone says, oh yes, we get more function points done than somebody else. I go, well, yes. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, a are you consistent able to consistently measure these function points of which you speak and b does it actually matter because actually i would rather write software with less function points that provides more value to the users and allows them to get their job done better that's what yeah. matters um so so many things have fallen apart based on that what i liked about what dora was doing was it really looked to try and correlate software development activities with business outcomes yes and that was the kind of one of the fundamental ties in that says if we can correlate organizations that do well on the business level with some of the software practices that they do then we feel we've got something that has a real value yeah. and yeah. initially when jez talked to me about it i mean when i when i very first come across the dora reports i remember reading the dora report and thinking this feels like complete bullshit, but <laughs> this is Jez. Jez doesn't do bullshit. So I need yeah. to talk to Jez and yeah. he needs to explain to me why this stuff isn't as bullshitty as it looks. Yeah. And his basic answer was, well, I could do, but you better talk to Nicole because she's the real um, mind behind yeah. this. And we got on a call um, and she went through outlining the kinds of the techniques she was using. And although I don't understand the details of the techniques, mm -hmm. I got enough of impression to convince me that this was actually kosher. Yeah. Um, and 
at the heart of it, as I said, is this connection of business performance correlating to the technical techniques and then looking at how that correlation operates to begin to say, oh, okay, there's actually some causation involved in this. Yeah. And then that led to many things. And in fact, um, we kind of joke that uh, I, I was having dinner with Nicole and said, come on, if you don't write this stuff up, I'm going to write it up. And that kind of teased her to say, oh, I've got to write this stuff up. I don't want to be stealing this. Um, and if that was true, I will happy to take the credit. <laughs> and it led to the Accelerate book, which I think is such an important book. Yes. Um, because it really does demonstrate very solidly the kinds of delivery practices that we argue about, argue for. Yes. Um, this really good, solid data that says they are effective and, and people yes. should be using them. Yeah, and profoundly so. As I, 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 th I think one of the things that trips us up as an industry very often is that I, I think our discipline is one that probably appeals to people with a technical mindset, a, 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 probably a science background of some kind and, and so on, and, and a bent towards mathematics. I, I, that seems to me the kinds of minds that mm -hmm. enjoy solving problems in software. Um, and the problem there is that I, I think often we're looking to too much precision. And what we're talking about here is sociology. And sociology is not the same as physics. It's not it's right. not hard maths. You can't prove it. It's hard to carry out experiments with genuine controls. And so you have to take different techniques. But Nicole uh, has applied those techniques diligently. This is genuine science in the, mm. at least at the level of sociology um, uh, and, and able to come, come up with this predictive model, this correlative model of, uh, of the ways in which certain behaviours lead to certain outcomes, certain outcomes are predicted by those behaviors and all, all, all that kind of stuff and that's a tool that we haven't had before really yeah with, with, with the same level of rigor yeah it's a th third one of the few cases when i've looked at something and it hasn't fell apart sort of within five minutes of serious yeah. examination yeah. um and i'm a big fan of that work and uh, very keen to see the, the further stuff that uh, um, yeah. she continues I, to go out I, and do um really, I, I, really I, I, I think Really impressive stuff. I, I, I think I think the measurement measures aren't perfect. That that that, that you've chosen measures that are going to kind of suit the act, the outcome a little bit, but 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 I think they're the best we've got so far. You know, that, that, mm. that, and 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 that's I, I I agree with you. I think it's a deeply important book. And we certainly push our clients to try and pay attention to the four key metrics. And yeah. Um, I mean, and they aren't perfect, partly because they focus on the delivery part, which is, uh, is once you've written the code, getting into yep. production. And of yep. course, there's a whole before part of that that we've got to look at. But the core idea of small cycles, rapid, yep. lots yep. of small steps is at the heart of this. Absolutely. And, um, that's always been something that we've been uh, big fans, of course. You know, do small things, set up feedback loops. Um, operate from there. I, I, I came up with a nice analogy recently. I, I, I well, uh, I actually wrote it in my book, but but it's it, it's it's like it, it's like the importance of feedback really, and the way that mm. it drives nearly everything is that you know if we if we're tasked with balancing a broom, you could, we could calculate the center of mass of the broom and the little dome on the handle of the broom and precisely position it so that the center of mass, the lines from the center of mass passes through the point of contact on the table and there's no impulse on the broom. And there's one answer to that problem, essentially. Or we can put the broom on our hand and we can move our hand around. Right. And the, the rate at which we gather feedback and react means that we can either move our hand really small or, or make, make big moves. But you know, that's how space rockets work. Like, this, is not, this, is not, this is not lower quality. This is the right. most effective strategy to dealing with change in problems and, and yes. optimizing for that fast feedback is seems to me fundamental and essential. It's the tool that I use in my clients to to guide them towards better practice. And it works. Yeah, this is the metaphor of uh, of that, uh, the pra pragmatic programmers, um, Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt came up when they talked about um, tracer bullets. You know, if you want to shoot at a target, you can carefully calculate absolutely everything to get your absolute shot there. Yeah. But yeah. often the best way is to just fire a lot of shots and have tracer bullets that show what's going on and you'll yeah. get there quicker. Yeah. Um, as long as your bullets are cheap, yeah. that works. Yeah, and of yeah. course, there, there again, we talk about context. 
Yeah. Um, different contexts require different approaches. Um, but in software, our bullets are cheap. It's very yeah. easy to come up with new versions of software. We can write software really quickly. So yes. we can afford to go that kind of direction. Yes. Now, not all software in that case. Uh, there is certain situations in safety critical software or software that can't easily be updated, like software you put in a, uh, a space probe, for instance, it's going mm -hmm. off to the outer planets of the solar system. Eh, then it, it, you know, continuous delivery gets a bit tricky under those circumstances. And you have but to think differently. It's it's that's one of the uh, that's one of the areas where I I, I think I, I I slightly disagree in that I think that working so that your software is always releasable even if you don't release your space probe all of the oh time, yeah absolutely is, I mean that's, that's, absolutely yes. you know fundamental that's why I said passes. continuous delivery right not uh, well okay. I should have said continuous deployment yeah yeah but the point <laughs> is that um, you know, you, you understand when I'm talking about the tracer bullets in that context, I am looking very broadly in terms of getting it into production, yeah, yeah. And getting the feedback loop from there, because yeah. that with commercial systems, that's what you want. You want to get your stuff out there, people using it, telling you why it's not effective, yeah. either yeah. directly or indirectly, and then modifying and improving. You can't yeah. do that with a space probe. Um, yeah. because the feedback loops can't be set up to be fast enough yeah, yeah. Um, in so, deployment. But that doesn't stop you doing continuous delivery, as you point out, because yeah, yeah. as you're building something, you can still set up a test environment and go through that same process. Yeah, and and, and do a lot in simulation. Yes. Uh, so so I, I, I'm working with several suppliers of medical devices of various kinds yeah. at the moment, which are safety critical. And, you know, you, 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 you try and... You, it's great when you can shorten the timescale into production because that re reduces the delta and therefore the risk you know of change that's going into production but getting that feedback however you can get it in and then pragmatically you just get as close to as frequent as possible it's it's my it's one of my criticisms of the dora metrics is that i think that the the release frequency is not always possible in all contexts and so that kind of right. compromises them a little bit but, but well, that's important of the simulator right and then people would shy away yeah. from writing a simulator um yeah. because you know it's not necessary um, yes, right it's yes. not part of your final deliverable but uh, it's simulated can be a hugely valuable thing to help you get to where you're going yeah. i mean if you're building some hardware and the hardware is not going to be available until you know a year's time you, yeah. you're writing your code in the hopes that it's going to fit the hardware is you know questionable but if you rebuild a simulator of that hardware yeah. then when it comes when you actually have to fit the code to the hardware what you're looking at is are the variances between the simulator and that hardware and if you've built the simulator to the same specs um hopefully that variance can be fairly small and when you get integration problems you've got a better chance of figuring out what's going on because you can say either my simulator assumptions were wrong or i've got a bug that i can replicate in the simulator yeah um, I, I, saw, I saw i saw a great example recently in a tesla of apparently um upped the charging rate for their model three cars and they mm -hmm. did that in th i think it was three hours so so the, right. the, the charging the maximum charging rate on the model three has gone up from 200 kilowatt hours to 250 and they did that right. in three hours because it's test driven development the, the car and they ran it through the simulator it passed and so it went onto the production line three hours later in right. the car you know yep. so so you know I, I think i think i think there's some i i think that when we're talking about continuous delivery that we're really talking about genuine software engineering principles and i think yes. i think that's you know that's why this stuff works yeah absolutely I, I think i think that our time is up and i would like to thank you for the fascinating conversation and exploration of all of these these topics and thank you for for agreeing to to, to join us today um let me say thank you to our viewers so so uh, as i said this is the first in a, a short series in the lead up to the end of the year um we'll be releasing these weekly uh, martin's the the first guest and um, as you can see, deep, broad insights into the computer industry. I hope you've enjoyed listening as much as I'd, I've enjoyed the conversation. If you have any observations on any of the ideas that we've talked about, just add them to the comments below. Thank yes, you. And, and also to the viewers, if you enjoyed this, um, do hit the thumb button on the bottom and uh, <laughs> indicate your appreciation. Um, I won't do my heavy cardboard routine. It's probably not appropriate for a professional situation, but <laughs> hit hit the fun button. Say you liked it. 
subscribe to the channel um, and enjoy more of what Dave produces. <laughs> Thank you, Marcy. Thank you.